Good morning or good afternoon or good evening whenever you happen to be watching this. This is the first of two antibiotic lectures. So just for some frame of reference, this is the only time really in the course I split up the discussion between drugs specifically and then disease states treatment specifically. So normally I cover them both at the same time. The thing about antibiotics is they can apply to a lot of different disease states and a lot of different systems. So I think it's easier and the way I like to think about them personally is look at spectrum of activity. So that means what type of bacteria the particular antibiotic covers. Look at them as a class as a whole. Though so generally class classes have side effects that apply to every drug in the class. Or for example, most drugs in the class will be renally adjusted. Uh, so if you can remember them in terms of class specifics and then look at them in terms of individuals and some of the specifics uh, coverage spectrums that differ within the class, I think that's the best way to approach it. If you can get that down, so like for example, if you know that a certain antibiotic covers a certain bacterial species quite well, and you know that a certain disease state is known to be caused by said bacterial species, you can put two and two together and uh, prescribe that antibiotic for that condition. And that's generally the logic behind infectious diseases and how we treat bacterial infections. So again, we're going to go through the specific infections that are pretty common and talk about the first line drugs and guidelines and things like that in the in the next set of in the next face to face lecture we have but this is a good almost background is into anti infective therapies and how they're organized how they're classified and side effects so certainly very important and from a test perspective very important from a practice perspective very important one of the things i get year after year is people coming back at the end of the year, because I do cover some antibiotics and uh, infectious disease in the summer when we talk about emergency medicine, we talk about pediatrics, talk about pregnancy and peripartum issues. Those all have an anti-infective components to them. And so people are like, wait a second, I kind of forgot all this. So I really encourage you to, to take the time and invest into this. It's going to be very valuable in any practice scenario you go into. I can't think of a single practice uh, site that wouldn't use anti-infectives in some capacity, uh, whether you work in acute care, primary care, um, some specialized surgical practice, anyone is going to have some sort of anti-infective uh, prescribing involved with it. And I, so anyway, for your personal practice for this course, and just as a PA in general, I highly recommend you, you invest a fair amount of time into this. And I think it'll pay off for you, not only in the course, but in the long term as well. Okay. Uh, so when we talk about antibiotics, antibiotic as a term kind of means anti-life, right? Well, antibiotic is technically an overarching branch, so you could put antifungals in there and everything else. But most people use antibiotics synonymously with antibacterial agents. So when we talk about antibiotics, we're talking about antibacterial agents for the most part. Uh, most people will define an antiviral, antifungal specifically by those names. So if I say, hey, let's talk about using an antifungal. Uh, if I say an antibiotic, you can assume I'm talking about antibacterial agents, so we're all on the same page as far as terminology goes. It's really the most common group of drugs. Uh, George is going to talk to you today about antivirals, and there's certainly some common applications to antiviral therapy. Antifungal therapy is a lot more variable as far as the conditions we use to treat it. So sometimes we can use them for really sick, very immunocompromised patients, and other times it's kind of run-of-the-mill like yeast infection type things or thrush. And uh, we'll cover that in a very short subset lecture uh, that I'll have posted for you next week. So anyway, we're talking about antibacterial agents. Basically, there's a couple different primary mechanisms of action here. And antibiotics generally fall into either cell wall inhibitors, so they inhibit the bacteria from being able to form a fully functional cell wall, and protein synthesis inhibitors, which work intracellularly to prevent the replication of protein structures within the bacterial cell. There's a couple other ones, some work on DNA uh, replication as well, which we'll talk about in, in a specific set, but those are kind of the two major subtypes of mechanisms when we're looking at antibiotics. Um, most antibiotics in general are fairly well tolerated and can be used in a wide variety of patients. So a lot of the antibiotics we use on a day-to-day -day basis in, let's say a regular adult population work great in kids, they work well in pregnant patients. Uh, they work well in um, all types of uh, comorbid disease states. There's not a lot of contraindications to antibiotics, and we'll get to some of the specific ones here. But for the most part, they're a pretty well tolerated, pretty safe group. And the other thing to think about with antibiotic therapy is people rarely take antibiotics for more than a week or two. Now, there's some conditions where you might have an extended course, but even so, 
let's look at an osteomyelitis or an infection, infected endocarditis where you might be on a month or month and a half, two months of therapy. That's still not a lot when you think about some people take, you know, antihypertensive or an antidepressant for their whole life. And so when it comes to chronic side effects, we don't really have to be too concerned about antibiotics. It's more the acute phase. And a lot of drugs, when you take them for such a short period of time, don't have a lot of lasting side effects, which is a good thing for our patients. Um, I'll talk a little bit about antibiotic stewardship. Resistance to antimicrobials is always something we're concerned about, and it's something we always want to keep in the back of our minds. And this gets a little confusing, I think, because prescribing practices really vary a lot place to place and how that, in, how that impacts your resistance patterns locally and how you should be a good steward of your resources will fall into play uh, depending on where you work. And so it's just something to keep in the back of your mind and I'll, I'll touch base on that a little bit more in a few slides here. One thing to always remember when prescribing antibiotics, especially for elderly patients or patients with renal dysfunction, is that they're going to be likely renally adjusted medications. There's a few that aren't, and I'll point those out specifically, but for the most part, whenever you're prescribing any antibiotic, it should be a little um, light that goes off in your head that says, okay, does this patient need any renal adjustment? And remember, we talked about creatinine clearance, those types of things last week, just to make sure that you have that uh, concept down that the lower the output of the kidneys, so the lower the creatinine clearance or lower the GFR, the, the medication might need to be dose adjusted that way. And we'll talk about that specifically uh, with a few examples here. Some resources for antibiotics. Uh, there's a number of them out there. IDSA is Infectious Diseases Society of America. They're kind of like the gold standard when it comes to any anti-infective use guidelines. So anything from C. diff to pneumonia to um, endocarditis, they have everything on there. So uh, if you want to look at more of the guidelines, and yeah, guidelines can be long and kind of cumbersome, and guidelines aren't absolute either, but uh, IDSA does a great job, I think. I think the guidelines are very practical, and they have always good summaries, so you can read like the first few pages of it, or um, if they have an executive summary synopsis of it, you can check that out too. A lot of times they have nice tables and algorithms as well, so if you want to look more into it, if you're like, I'm really not understanding community-acquired pneumonia, Chad's really confusing me, Go to IDSA, check out their CAP guidelines, and see if maybe that gives you a little more impact. So I'll be teaching off IDSA guidelines, but just so that you know, that's that's a big resource for you out there. And those are free to access for anyone. You don't need a subscription or anything like that. Uh, the Sanford Guide, I talked about this a little bit when I talked about references. This is a, a little book that people buy, and it has spectrum of activity for all your antibiotics and uh, bacteria cross-reference. So you can look really quickly to say, okay, does this antibiotic cover this specific bug and can I use it for this treatment? It's a nice way to quickly reference something like that. And again, there's an online version that's really handy. I would just caution you for carrying a Sanford book around for like 10 years. I've seen some really old ones <laughs> in providers' pockets before. And antibiotic resistance does change year to year and especially over a decade will change substantially so some drugs we were using first line 10 years ago we don't use it all anymore uh, for those maybe for those specific conditions so the point is to make sure that you're keeping yourself up to date so if you really like the Sanford guide and like that paper reference great but buy a new one every year they aren't super expensive um, a lot of times you get them, get them for free if you go to conventions and things like that. They hand them out. I remember as a student and as a resident, I would always find free ones floating around. Or your institution might buy them for you if you could do that. Or sometimes places have money and reimbursement and things like that. So anyway, you should be able to find some way to do that if you don't have access to the online reference. There is an app, I think, for Sanford, too. I don't personally use it, so I'm not going to speak to it. But I know I have some colleagues that have it. Uh, CDC, MDH has the vaccine schedules and a lot of other stuff. So I just said vaccine schedules here. It doesn't really do the website full service. I mean, it's got everything from STD guidelines to resistance patterns to antimicrobial stewardship advice, all types of different stuff on the website there. The vaccine schedule is probably the most convenient source of information if you're doing any vaccination. So if you work in primary care and vaccination is something that's common part in your common place in your practice, something you're gonna get to know pretty well but it's a really easy, quick reference. There's also a lot of resources on the CDC website that talk about common myths about certain things like vaccines and autism, for example. We aren't really gonna talk about vaccines a lot for this block just because we have a lot of other information. I'm gonna talk more specifically about vaccines 
during the pediatric lecture in the summer. George will go through maybe a brief synopsis of some vaccines during his lecture today, but really nothing testable on vaccinations. And again, we'll cover those in more depth during the pediatric portion next summer. Um, there's some other paper references. The Emergency Medicine Residents Association puts out this little guide that has some nice little tidbits on prescribing antibiotics for certain infections. It's got some interesting uh, like odd things in it. For example, you've got a patient with cellulitis and they were in a lake for the day. Okay, so what does that make? Does that make your exposure different? Is it the same treatment? And so they might have some different stuff like that. And we'll talk about some of those subtype infections during our lecture before the exam. But just so you have a, a clearer picture of that, that is a reference. Um, John Hopkins publishes an antibiotic guide that has a bunch of information in it. Um, some people like to use that. Personally, I don't really use it a whole lot. But then you should have access to clinical specialists in some degree. So does your clinic consult with an ID service? Do you have an ID provider that works with your clinic system? Do you have uh, an ID group that practices at your hospital? Do you have pharmacists that are ID specialists? We have a couple different ID groups at Abbott when we have um, a team of two. We have two clinical coordinators that work with um, specifically antimicrobial stewardship and some practices and, and projects around that. And then we have a specialized resident in that area too. So we have some resources like that that we can bounce ideas off of. And I really like having that person available to me uh, when I run into a case that's tricky, or if I just want to say, can I talk to you about this and make sure this makes sense? And certainly uh, a regular non-ID specialist pharmacist would be able to answer some of those questions for you too. And at the very least, it's a nice sounding wall to say, a lot of times my providers come to me and say, hey, you know, I've got this person with pneumonia and they've got, they're on anticoagulation. I don't want to risk too much of a drug interaction. What do you think I was going to do this combination? Is that okay? And usually I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. That's perfectly reasonable. Sometimes I might say, well, what, what about this and that? Maybe let's try this instead. It's a simpler regimen or it's less likely to interact with their current drug. So I might offer a second option. A lot of times there's multiple pathways to the right choice within infectious diseases. So you can prescribe different regimens to treat the same thing and still be within the guidelines and still be within a correct practice or best practice even. And there might be debates on, well, this one might be slightly better because of such and such. But for the most part, there are not, there's a lot of times for some of these first line reg regimen recommendations, there's not solid evidence to say that one is really better than the other. It's more provider practice or um, provider preference, I should say. Okay, I've talked enough about that. Let's talk about some of the antibiotic terminology and things you might hear. Uh, this is getting a little bit nitty gritty and into the weeds, and I'm not going to test you on a ton of this stuff, but I do want you to have a general idea of um, antibiotic interpretations. And you will have to interpret a spectrum, uh, or, or excuse me, um, a sensitivity report from a lab on the exam. So we'll go through some of this and what this generally means. A couple things to think about with antibiotics. There's a, a concept called mean inhibitory concentration, which is MIC. And then there's cutoffs. And I'll show you an example on the next slide and illustrate that a little bit more. But the idea is that you have to get a certain level of blood serum concentration to be able to inhibit growth of that bacteria. So when we talked last week about um, concentration uh, and area under the curve and therapeutic index and all those types of things, that's kind of what we're getting at here. You have to be a certain blood concentration for a certain amount of time to be able to get that, uh, that bacteria killed sufficiently. And that's what the cutoff level is. So the cutoff is something your microbiology lab will actually assign. So if they're testing a specific bacteria that's growing against a number of antibiotics, they'll say, okay, what's the cutoff? Remind me tomorrow. Uh, what's the cutoff for this particular drug as far as an MIC goes? We have the MIC that we know. It's in the literature. And they'll give it a certain MIC and say, okay, this drug requires, maybe they have two different strains of something and one thing requires Let's just throw out a random number. Um, well, actually, let me let me just stop my train of thought here. I'll show you the picture on the next slide, and it'll make a lot more sense. So hold that for a minute. Um, let's talk about bacterial cytal versus bacterial static. Bacterial cytal is more common, faster killing antibiotic. And it's the preferred choice for most things. If you can do a bacterial cytal antibiotic, that's going to be better. And so sometimes you'll see people pick one over the other. And basically, they aren't really any different as far as spectrum of activity. They're both going to kill the bug effectively. One will do it faster, and that's going to be bacterial cytal. Most are bacterial cytal. 
And, um, but they do vary in how they do that. So some are concentration dependent. This is more unusual where they actually have to reach a certain level of peak concentration to be able to kill the bacteria. Other ones are what we call time dependent where really they just need to be over that MIC, usually at two to four times the MIC. So just slightly above it um, compared to like 10 times MIC. So if we think about this, if you're trying to target 10 times your MIC, you have to push a lot more drug into the patient's body in a short amount of time. What that does is it increases risk for side effects. So remember our therapeutic index, a lot of times you might be pushing over that therapeutic index. So we're going to talk about aminoglycosides, which work in this category of uh, concentration dependent killing. And aminoglycosides are notorious for renal failure and ototoxicity and some other nasty side effects. We don't use them a lot anymore. Part of that is because they are this concentration dependent killing and you really just blast them as far as a really high dose, get them at a high concentration, let them kind of taper off, and that's how they work best. Whereas some of our more standard antibiotics, like our beta-lactam classes or penicillins and whatnot, those work on a time dependent. So really we just have to get above that MIC by two to four times, not enough to really cause any side effects in most patients. And then what we get is a sustained effect as long as we can keep it above that MIC for however many days. So five days, seven days, 14 days, something like that. Now the tricky part is dosing it and keeping those dose intervals so that we aren't dipping below our, our MIC cutoff. And that's the big problem with some antibiotics is you have to give them four times a day to be able to accomplish that. Fortunately, it's only again for like a week or two at most for most treatments, but still it's something to consider for compliance in patients. I'm not going to go into hybrid. It gets a little confusing. There are some that have area under the curve and MIC and it gets you can look at it in a more um, specialized way to say well let's not talk about time or concentration let's look at area under the curve fully so you could have kind of a, again a hybrid of both approaches as long as your area under the curve is good but we really don't care about this in most cases and the nice thing for you guys and for me is that most of the stuff like I alluded to last year kinetic studies are already done we know how drugs act we know how to get to that MIC we know how to be it we, if this has been tested in certain disease state. We know that if we give uh, cephalexin three or four times a day, we're likely going to get steady state serum levels that are going to be enough to treat any infection that cephalexin or any bacteria that is sensitive to cephalexin. That's just the way it is. We know that that's been studied. We know that the dosing is pretty standard for that. We don't really have to think about this. So just again, to give you guys some background on how this all works, Bacterial static just prevents bacterial regrowth. It's, it is effective. It is slower. Again, I'll say that one more time. Uh, and post-antibiotic effect is something that happens mostly with these concentration-dependent killers. So concentration-dependent killers are going to have the ability, to, again, to get really high levels right off the bat and they taper off. And the thing is, is that they usually kill so much bacteria with that one shot that it takes a while for those remaining few cells to regrow. So you get a little bit of post-antibiotic effect with that. And it just lasts. So you can, the idea is you can actually deplete the body. The body can completely eliminate this, bacteria, this antibiotic because it's got such high concentrations and your bacterial regrowth isn't going to happen for a while still. So you don't need steady state serum concentration is the point with that. But again, that's not a very common thing, uh, and I'll point out the, the drugs that that actually applies to. Okay, uh, this is uh, what I was getting at when I was kind of mumbling through MICs and cutoffs and stuff like that. I think it's easier to look at this. So some of you guys have maybe seen these before. Some of you guys might have lab experience. I'm not sure. But the idea here is that this is a standard culture report. So this is a urine culture. Um, a skin soft tissue culture, any other culture would look pretty similar, blood culture. They all kind of look the same. It does depend, the source will depend on what particular antibiotics they're testing. For like a urine culture, for example, we aren't as concerned about all the IV choices we have. We're more concerned maybe about PO choices. So a lot of these times you're going to see more oral options on some of these reports versus like if it's a blood culture, you might see some more broad spectrum stuff. So it just might depend on what they're testing. Usually these are prefabricated from some company. So some company makes a disc that's a, a media growth plate. So they can take the cultured sample or the urine, they can swab the growth plate, and then it's got these discs on it that represent different drugs. And then depending on how much growth and how close that growth can get to those discs, 
that gives you, and then they measure that and, and apply that somehow. I don't, I'm not exactly sure on the exact measurements and how they make that all work. But the point is, is that that is your MIC and that's how lab determines that. So when lab evaluates this, they go through their disk and they look at all the little disks and say, okay, well, how did the bacteria, so we know this bacteria is growing E. coli. They did a gram stain on it. They did a number of other tests to determine, yes, indeed, this is E. coli. They look at it under a microscope or whatnot. And then they do their growth. And so they say, well, we have a couple different options here that we're testing, but we're going to report it this way. So this is common notation. What the R and I mean, R is for resistant, I is for intermediate, and S is for sensitive. So when we're trying to treat somebody, we want to avoid anything that's R and probably avoid anything that's I. Intermediate sort of like a crapshoot. You don't really know exactly if it's going to cover it. There's some theory out there that for urinary tract infections only, that a lot of these drugs will concentrate really well in the bladder, and therefore they're such high concentrations compared to like a bloodstream infection, for example, that for intermediate sensitivities it might be okay. However, generally we avoid them. And for anything other than urine, urinary tract infection, we're going to completely avoid anything with intermediate sensitivity. It's just not worth the risk, especially for a serious infection. So. What we're looking at here is what we can prescribe this patient reasonably. So here we have um, a couple drugs that are resistant. So a lot of times in my job, what I do for, for our ED uh, pharmacy team, we do all the follow-up cultures reviews. So I might get something that looks like this. And let's say the patient was sent home on ciprofloxacin. Well, I'll look at this and say, yep, resistant. Uh, and then I'll have to go and see, okay, what's it sensitive to? And I kind of think of my standard other urinary tract infection agents. I look at the patient's allergies. I look at what have they been on in the past and try and see what might work for them. Uh, in this case, even though Bactrim, I'm going to talk about Bactrim uh, a little bit more next week, but Bactrim is uh, sulfamethoxyl trimethoprim or Septra is the other brand name of that. You guys have might have heard of that. It's kind of a common antibiotic. It was a long time a gold standard for UTIs. Now it's almost always resistant. Well, not, I, that, that's, that's an exaggeration, I'm sorry. It's got about uh, 20 to 25% resistance, which is quite high. When I started practicing, it was in the upper, you know, like the amount sensitive was probably 85 or so, which is not bad. Uh, but the idea is that if you prescribe somebody Bactrim without knowing the sensitivities, you have a, pretty much a one in five shot of that person not getting better. So it's not a good first line option anymore. But in this case, I actually know that it's sensitive. So I could call this person, tell them, stop your Cipro, stop, stop your Cipro and start a three-day course of Bactrim and, and be done with it. I would never recommend Bactrim right off the bat unless there are a lot of other circumstances that made sense about that. But in this case, uh, it, it, it works because you actually have the evidence right in front of you. This usually takes a day or two to come back from your lab. So you won't know this right away when you're empirically, by, when I say empirically, I mean kind of prescribing without knowing. So your empiric decision is based on facts and what we know about what generally works. Um, and in this case, we know that Bactrim is high resistant to a urinary tract infection. So we're not gonna prescribe that right away. But once we get our information, then it might make sense to prescribe something that we wouldn't necessarily prescribe right off the bat. Um, other things we can see here. So when I was getting at MIC versus cutoff, these numbers are all the MIC. So these are the mean inhibitory concentrations. And the cutoff is what lab determines as resistant or sensitive. So that's really all it is. It's, it's where the number is. So I'll, and labs might vary depending on how they report this. Some might not even report intermediate sensitivities. They might just say it's all resistant. Uh, but in this case, they have a, a guideline in their lab that says for ampicillin sulbactam, which is unison, you have, once you hit 16, that's not considered sensitive anymore. It's considered intermediate. And same thing for some of these other ones. Other ones, you can see that they have a cutoff that meets it uh, that all corresponds as sensitive. It doesn't really matter. So what really matters is the letter. So what, what lab is saying is R or S, that's the big deal um, for you guys and for me too. There are a couple antibiotics that they might report as sensitive with, if they have a higher MIC, we might consider not using them. Vancomycin is a good example of that, but that's really the only one I can think of. The thing about MICs that gets trips people up, I've had a couple providers ask me this over my career, and they come to me and say, well, okay, I wanna prescribe, let's say I'm in between, let's say I'm treating, this person's gonna come into the hospital, they've got urosepsis, I wanna give something, one of these IV, broader spectrum cephalosporin antibiotics. And in between cefepime, uh, well, that's not a good example. Let's say I'm between cefazolin 
and uh, ceph triaxone. Which one should I give, Chad? Well, I'll say, and then I'll say, well, you know, look into the allergies. Why would you need to do one or the other? Ceph triaxone is kind of a nice drug because it's once a day, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, well, what I'm really concerned about is this MIC. So this number says it's four, and this one says it's one. So the one must be better, right? Well, actually, no. All it has to do with is how the lab reports it. So for example, that four is just the cutoff and they don't really care as long as it's less than four. It might be way less than that, but we don't really know. So they're giving a like a less than or equal to four. So again, it might be one, it might be two, who knows what it actually is. They just know it's less than four. That means it's sensitive and we really don't care about anything other than that. So the number doesn't really matter with the exception of a few certain drugs. So again, my, my point here is that when I give you something like this on an exam, I'm going to care about the S or the R, and that's what you need to know and be able to interpret. So if I give you, I'll give you a scenario that says so-and-so is discharged on a certain antibiotic, I'll give you a list of resistances and say, what should you do at this point? Should you change it, keep it the same, uh, and what drug should you switch it to? So not only will you have to know the, the appropriate agents for that particular disease you're trying to treat, but you'll have to be able to interpret the sensitivity report as well. And that's a very common thing you're going to have to do in real life. So I'll give you an example of that as far as a case review we'll do at some point here. But the point is, is that um, these are really important and they, they will guide your therapy. And certainly you can use this to narrow your therapy too. Let's say you started somebody on a really broad spectrum antibiotic. They come into the hospital, they're uroseptic, they're really sick, you start them on cefepine, which is really broad spectrum cephalosporin. It comes back and you're like, oh, I could decrease it to ceftriaxone now. Or maybe oral therapy might work now. Let's try Bactrim or something like that. So there's some uh, ways you can make your, that's called being a good steward of your antibiotics. So you're taking your broad spectrum agent, using it when you think you really need it, and then pulling it back as soon as you can. You don't want to use antibiotics unnecessarily but you also want to kill that bacteria effect effectively. So when you switch it, you want to make sure you have a good reason to do so. And this would be a case where you would have some evidence to support that decision. Okay, I've probably talked way too much about this, um, but we're going to keep moving and talk about some of the actual drugs here. Oh, resistance and stewardship. Okay, if I haven't talked about this enough, talk about this already. All right, resistance is a constant threat. Um, your local resistant patterns, I'll show you an example of what this looks like, are really important to understand. Um, that just goes for empiric prescribing usually. Again, if you have a sensitivity report, you don't really care about whatever the local pattern is. But like, let's say in Minnesota, we're really highly resistant to this drug, but in Florida, they're really highly resistant to another type of drug for the same bacteria. It's possible that regional differences will exist. So just to keep that in mind. Um, I'll show you an example of an antibiogram, what that is in a second. Don't use anything that you don't have to. If you don't have to use an antibiotic at all, don't do it. If you don't have to go broad spectrum when you don't need to, don't do it. Use the most appropriate choice. Ideally, you want the most narrow spectrum drug, meaning it covers the least amount of, least amount of bacteria and still effectively treats the patient. Um, I would say think very carefully be before prescribing an antibiotic. Sometimes it's an open and shut case. It's very obvious. Other times you really should think, okay, what's the patient getting out of this? Is this really going to be the best option for them? Do they really need an antibiotic? That's a big question that I think a lot of providers need to ask themselves more of and say, you know, this isn't a case where we need to prescribe antibiotics. And sometimes that might not make your patient happy, but that's the way we should be practicing in some cases. Um, broad spectrum antibiotic therapy does not equal better outcomes. We wanna make sure we're treating appropriately. Don't go necessarily broad if you don't have to. Um, some points to consider, patient history. So I always look at exposure. Have they been in a hospital recently? Is, are they at risk for nosocomial pathogens, which we'll talk about? Um, are they uh, risk for previous cultures? As far as did they have um, a recent history of a, a resistant pathogen or have they always grown the same thing? You can look at some of the recent data behind them. How long were they treated for? Was it effective? Did it help the patient? or did they kind of get a little bit better but never fully better so a lot of times i see that with recurrent utis they come in they took a course of something a month ago for a week it worked they felt great now they have another uti a month later now was that a failure of therapy eh, it's hard to say probably not it sounds like it did work um, but now we're faced with the choice of do we want to prescribe that same agent or not and that's the thing you know a clinical decision to make and allergies, what's the patient allergic to? Have they had a bad reaction to an antibiotic in the past? 
Uh, and then my, my little story here, if you, if you continue to lose certain classes of drugs, there may not be any options left for certain bugs. So you guys have probably heard this. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about, because you could do a whole hour, two hour talk on this on its own, but we do see super bugs popping up. We see things that just, we don't have really many options to. You'll hear about carbapenemase producing club Ciella. Um, we haven't had a lot of cases like that in Minnesota, fortunately, but um, a lot of this stuff is coming out of Europe and India. So it's probably only a matter of time before we see more cases popping up in the United States. Um, and good antimicrobial stewardship is really the way to fight those, 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 uh, um, those resistant bugs from cropping up. That's the number one way we can uh, prevent that. This is an antibiogram. Uh, obviously, this is old. It's from 2011. I'm not doing this to point out resistance patterns specifically, but if you zoom in and want to look at it, this is something your hospital microbiology lab and your, or your health system will report on a yearly basis. They put all this data together and it says out of all the isolates they've gotten, how many were resistant or susceptible to certain antibiotics. So if we go and look at, here's trimethoprim sulfa or Bactrim, and here's E. coli, which is our common urinary pathogen, 80% in 2011. So 80% is really at the point where we aren't comfortable prescribing that right off the bat. So I still see people do this sometimes where they prescribe Bactrim initially for UTI and don't know any other, any better really. Again, for one out of five shots, that patient is not going to get better. Not acceptable in my book. What you could do is look at here. So what else do we have that's susceptible? Um, a lot of these aren't oral. Cipro is even worse, 77%. Um, but we have like nitrofurantoin, which is macrobid, 96% susceptible. First generation cephalosporins, 95% susceptible. So a couple of nice options there we can try in, a, in alternative, as an alternative to uh, Bactrim or Cipro. Okay, if you're wondering if I was ever going to get into actual drugs, here we go. Beta-lactams are probably the most versatile, broad class, most common class of drugs we're going to use in the antibiotic realm. They represent four different major classes within them. And really within those, two of them, well, three of them, monobactams aren't really popular. But anyway, penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and then there is a monobactam. It's not really a class, it's more just a single drug. The thing about beta-lactams, as you can see, they all share a little bit of the same chemical structure. So you see the common ring here, this beta-lactam ring. So when you say beta-lactam, you can refer to a number of different antibiotic groups, and they really have a very broad range of use. So within beta-lactams, you have really old drugs like penicillin, brand new drugs that just came out a couple years ago. Um, they're all bactericidal. They all inhibit formation of the bacterial cell wall with time-dependent killing. So we're talking about time over MIC. They're all extremely well, well, most of them are very well tolerated, I should say. They have a really wide variety of spectrum of activity. Almost every single, single major regiment of anti-infective guideline recommended protocol involves a beta-lactam of some kind. Um, there's almost always a use for a beta-lactam or an alternative that includes a beta-lactam that's preferred. So when it comes to treating antibacterial uh, infections, uh, beta-lactams are almost always going to be a choice that is ap applicable. Now, there's some cases where we, we prefer something else or something else just makes more sense, but a lot of times beta-lactams work great. So um, one thing, some other things about beta-lactams, I should say, bacteria may have or develop the capability to produce beta-lactamase enzymes. So beta-lactamase is an enzyme that some bacteria will produce that breaks down that beta-lactam ring. So when the structures get more complicated, like for example, our carbapenem is a little bit different looking than a cephalosporin or a penicillin, a little bit more resilient to that, but you can also couple them with something called a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So sometimes you see drugs in combination, like for example, there's standard amoxicillin, which is a little bit of an advanced penicillin type molecule, and that is pretty highly susceptible to beta-lactamase producing bacteria. However, if you couple it with something called um, clavulanate, or which is brand name augmentin, that actually is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So what it will do is it will bind to the beta-lactamase that the bacteria is producing, effectively making it um, neutral so it doesn't do anything and your bacteria 
can be still susceptible. So it's taking down that first defense mechanism that the bacteria is, that the bacteria is trying to produce to counteract the uh, attack from the antibiotic drug. Uh, lots of lots of benefits. These are great drugs. Again, uh, minimal drug interactions for the most part. Good options in pregnant patients and children. Most all of them are tolerated in pregnant patients and have minimal side effects. Uh, most are dosed two to four times daily. It's probably the biggest downside with them is that they're frequently dosed. But that's that whole time over MIC concept is that we have to dose frequently to make sure our steady states are, are up. And a lot of times they don't have long half-lives. There is one major exception to that, which is a nice drug we use quite a bit, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, this is just showing penicillin binding proteins and going into a little bit more detail about how these drugs work from a mechanistic perspective. So with penicillin or oxacillin or really anything, uh, what happens is the beta-lactam drug binds to the penicillin binding protein. And it's called a penicillin binding protein because we first found out that that's where penicillin bound to and that's why it was effective as an antimicrobial. And so that that makes it so the bacteria can't continue its cell wall synthesis process, can't keep making these uh, amino acids chained together. Um, Another drug, vancomycin, actually works as a cell wall inhibitor, and it doesn't work on the penicillin binding protein. It actually binds to the actual amino acid chain itself, and therefore the penicillin binding protein cannot interact with it. So the whole point of this is just to show you a little bit of mechanistic properties behind how these drugs work. So general beta-lactam, again, binding directly here, a drug like vancomycin is working very similarly but different, and uh, we can use them together, and they work synergistically that way. So not really important for you to know, other than that it inhibits cell wall formation. That's really all I care about you knowing. All right, general beta-lactam side effects, very well tolerated. Uh, GI effects, any antibiotic is likely to have some effects on the GI flora. So most of them are probably going to cause some diarrhea uh, or some imbalance in that. Now, does probiotics or eating yogurt or anything like that help? Maybe. There's not actually a lot of good studies that say it does anything. Um, you can take most of them with a meal. And that can help with some of the upset stomach. If somebody's getting nauseous when they take it, that can be uh, something that will work for them. Usually the more broad spectrum the drug is, so especially ones that are coupled with beta-lactamase inhibitors, um, those tend to have more anaerobic activity. Anaerobes live in the GI tract. And so anything that has anaerobic activity is going to be more likely to kill off GI flora that's good for you and therefore cause you some temporary discomfort and diarrhea. If you give somebody a lot of beta-lactam, so if they have high dose or if they're renally impaired and you aren't dosing it correctly, you can have some central nervous system related side effects. So seizures and comas, uh, things like uh, hyperreflexia and myoclonus, so almost like muscle rigidity type stuff or muscle tremor type things, those can happen uh, with high dose beta-lactam. It's very rare. Some of them are more likely to cause it than others. I don't know if I've ever heard of a seizure in any of my patients being caused by something like this. But then again, I don't usually see that high dose stuff. Um, if you work at an ICU, you might see some of that stuff more frequently. So we can avoid this really easily if we use renal dosing appropriately. If we aren't dosing the patient properly, the more likelihood they are to accumulate it. If they're an older patient with renal dysfunction, we wanna make sure we're dosing it appropriately. And that's really all you have to do to, to counteract that or to prevent that side effect from happening. I talked about how they're good in pregnancy and lactation and in kids. Allergic reactions is probably one of the things that you're going to see a lot with these drugs. So you see this on patients' home medication or home allergy list a lot where they're allergic to some beta-lactam. It happened when they were three or um, they were allergic to something else uh, and then they, they thought it was, they're like, well, I think it was penicillin, but I'm not really sure. I don't really know anymore. Or, you know, I felt like kind of nauseous. A anyway. The thing is, is that these drugs tend to have a high propensity to show up on people's allergy lists. I always double check. I'll talk about allergy cross-reactivity here in a second, but I always double check and ask the patient, especially if it's something you really should be using on them. All right, basic penicillin still has some uses today. Penicillin G is an IV or IM product, and then the IM is called penicillin G benzathine, which is, it's like this milky white substance. You can see it here comes in this ridiculously big needle. Uh, it's given usually in the glute, and that's uh, usually used for like strep throat or actually syphilis. Uh, penicillin VK is the oral tablet or suspension. And really the, the biggest areas where we're still using 
penicillin are for streptococcal and meningococcal infections. So mostly gram positive bacterial agent, you see. So this is still the preferred agent for strep throat. It still works great for strep. Thing is, is anything beyond strep, it doesn't really work for. Um, meningococcal, yes, but we, we prefer some other agents for that. Um, the other thing that we still really like penicillin for, and most of it's because we don't really have a lot of evidence for other medications working, is syphilis. So syphilis is prevented, well not prevented, but um, the, the spread of syphilis into later stages is, pre is prevented by penicillin use post-exposure. And uh, penicillin is useful for treating syphilis in later stages as well. Uh, basically, anything that's a weak gram-positive strep will respond well to penicillin. Anything like staphylococcal, probably not going to respond to penicillin. And anything gram-negative is likely intrinsically resistant to regular penicillin. So because penicillin doesn't work great for staph, we have the anti-staphylococcal penicillins that were developed. So they're dicloxacillin, cloxacillin, nafcillin, oxacillin. Uh, don't spend a lot of time memorizing these drugs. They're very rarely used. The, the, basically, the only thing we ever use these drugs for is methicillin-susceptible staph aureus. So you guys have probably all heard of MRSA or MRSA. Well, this is the opposite of MRSA. MRSA is methicillin-resistant staph aureus, and there's a number of drugs we have to treat that specifically. These drugs, of course, would not treat that. But if you aren't MRSA and you have a staph infection, these drugs are kind of like a silver bullet. They really only treat this. Yeah, they would treat like some basic streps and stuff too. But none of them are very convenient. They're dosed like four to six times a day. They're actually kind of expensive because they're they're unusual. And so there's only a couple of companies that make them. Uh, and some of them have like snafcillin, for example, is a really strong CYP3A4 inducer. So it actually ramps up that 3A4 enzyme system, which can be problematic for a lot of patients taking 3A4 metabolized medications. Extended spectrum penicillins are ones we can add certain, uh, well, first of all, let's start with the bases. So the base would be amoxicillin or ampicillin. Amoxicillin and ampicillin are basically the same thing. One's PO, one's IV. They're very slightly different, but essentially you can consider them interchangeable. Um, now we can even, so these are going to work off of that concept of being anti-staphylococcal. So these will cover MSSA as well. But they have an extended spectrum where they'll pick up a few gram negatives. They'll be a little bit more resilient. And then if you add them or combine them with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, which I've got here in blue, you add uh, an additional level of coverage to their um, uh, spectrum. So most, most often you're increasing their ability to kill gram negative bacteria and you're allowing them to kill anaerobic bacteria, which by themselves without the beta-lactamase inhibitor, they really can't do as well. So you have the same thing here. You have amoxicillin and clavulanate, which is augmentin, which is your oral option. And then you have ampicillin and sulbactin, which is unison, which is the IV option. Good general coverage against basic gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. And again, the beta-lactamase will extend the spectrum. Don't think about, I would be careful thinking about unison or augmentin as broad spectrum. They kind of are technically, but there's a lot of things that they don't work for. And resistance is still pretty common for them. Um, they, they have some good utility here and there. But when you think about broad spectrum, you should think about piperacillin. So piperacillin is a drug that isn't used by itself. It's always given with tazobactam, and it's the brand name Zosin. Um, there's also another product called Tyker, or Tymentin, which is Tykercillin plus clavulanate. I don't know if I've ever seen Tymentin used. It's kind of like a lesser equivalent of Zosin. Everyone just uses Zosin. Um, Zosin is a really broad spectrum agent. It's one of our most broad spectrum antibiotics that we have. It covers essentially everything but MRSA. It covers some very hard to kill gram-negative species such as Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is something I'm going to talk about uh, again multiple times throughout this lecture. And Pseudomonas coverage really implies that this, this particular antibiotic has an extended spectrum that covers a lot of gram-negative species. And we kind of use Pseudomonas as a surrogate discussion point to say, yep, it covers Pseudomonas, also probably covers a lot of other stuff, but things that cover Pseudomonas, I think of as a very high level of gram-negative broad-spectrum activity, and we'll talk about that. So this is the first drug we're talking about today that covers Pseudomonas, and we'll put kind of some drugs in buckets here for your uh, learning preferences. But um, the one thing about these drugs uh, to consider as well is IV-only therapy. So if you can want to convert somebody to oral, it's not as simple as saying, okay, we'll just convert Zosin to Augmentin. No, that doesn't really work because Augmentin does not have the same spectrum of activity. So when you want to convert somebody off of Zosin to an oral regimen, it can be tricky 
because you have to consider probably switching them to different classes of medications to get the same coverage, if it's even possible at all. Again, very broad spectrum agent. This is a really high use first line agent for um, empiric high mortality infections. So septic patients with likely bloodstream infections, neutropenic fever, um, let's see, uh, I'm trying to think of some other ones. But anyway, if somebody is basically coming into the ER and they're they're in shock because of some kind of an some kind of an infection, likely, and we don't really know what it is. Zosin is very commonly used for those situations. Um, Zosin also, I should just say, has the anaerobic coverage uh, like these do too. So it covers GI bugs too. So for uh, example, really significant. GI infection, like a burst appendix, a lot of times they'll give Zosin prior to surgery, um, just because it covers a lot of GI-related flora and a ton of gram-negative stuff that could be seeping in there as well. Oops. All right. Uh, I'll point out one thing about Zosin, just to reiterate the point of time over MIC. We actually give Zosin with an extended infusion strategy where we dose it. Zosin was traditionally dosed every six hours. You infuse it over 30 minutes and then repeat. That gives you a lot of peaks and troughs. Um, if you extend the infusion, so we infuse Zosin over four hours now. And so we basically give it for four hours, stop it for four hours, and we start the next dose four hours later. We can give less Zosin over the whole day yet get better results because we're keeping it consistently above MIC. You're almost getting a steady state um, infusion where you're, or a continuous infusion where you're always giving the same amount of zosin, so you really stay on top of it. Your body doesn't really have a chance to metabolize much of it because it's not coming in very fast, and it stays at this level where it's constantly getting replenished. And it's a very effective strategy. Again, we've used this. There's a lot of good evidence that says you lower your resistance to zosin uh, by doing this or you lower the bacteria's capability of making resistance to, to zosin, and you get better outcomes, less medication given, cost savings, all kinds of good stuff. So anyway, you might see that done, that extended infusion strategy, if you see that. There's some evidence that other beta-lactams do that too. We don't do it for anything else, um, but uh, that, that, might, that could very well change in the future. All right, cephalosporin. Cephalosporins are broken down into four or five generations, depending on how you want to define them. Uh, basically, the, well, these can get kind of complicated just because there's a lot of them and there's a lot of the names. So what I suggest you do is think about them in terms of generation. But the general concept of the cephalosporin is that you start with a first generation cephalosporin, which probably has OK gram positive and some minor gram negative coverage. And the more along generation you get, you really expand that gram negative coverage substantially uh, to cover a lot more pathogens. So um, we'll get there in a second here. These are pretty well tolerated overall. Um, one thing to think about, just like with the penicillins that we talked about, those basic ones don't cover as much as the more advanced ones. So zosin is a much different beast than amoxicillin, right? Uh, same thing here. Your first generation drugs are very different than your fourth generation as far as what we used, what, what, uh, what diseases we're treating, and also what bacteria they can cover. So our first generations, we have cephalexin and cefazolin, or keflex and ancef. They're thought to be relatively interchangeable. They are different. They aren't quite as similar as amoxicillin and ampicillin. In fact, cefazolin actually has a bit broader coverage than cephalexin. But for the purposes of this class, let's talk about them as interchangeable. They really have great streptococcus coverage, and they have good methicillin-susceptible staph aureus, or MSSA, coverage. They have some gram-negative coverage as well. In fact, they work quite well for E. coli and some other common species, which we don't really see with the basic penicillins. Um, it's really the workhorse antibiotic and skin and soft tissue infection. So if we know there's no MRSA involvement, this is almost a preferred line for anybody. We use it a ton for pre-surgical prophylaxis for people who don't have an MRSA history or risk. And uh, it's, it's just simply a, a very nice antibiotic that has a lot of use, minimal side effects, and uh, tends to be pretty resilient to uh, those resistances from MSS, MSSA or any strep resistance. Uh, we've actually started using cephalexin a lot more in urinary tract infections because it covers E. coli better than Cipro, covers it better than Bactrim. And so it's become almost our first line agent for, uh, for certain UTIs in patients too. So again, don't forget about that gram positive coverage. This is a great skin and, so skin and soft tissue bug, but it works well for, uh, for UTIs as well. 
Uh, second gen cephalosporins get a little bit more confusing. I don't want you to spend a lot of time thinking about a second gen cephalosporin. Where I would focus, I highlighted a few of these, but really cefiroxine is probably the big one here. Cefiroxine comes as an IV and a PO form. They do have some better gram-positive activity. So you add on some different gram-positives like H. influenza, M. catarhalis, which uh, are usually associated with like sinusitises and uh, ENT type infections. Now, if you're looking at somebody, we'll talk about ENT, but if you're advancing your ENT, ther if you well, if you give somebody a basic drug for ENT, like let's say amoxicillin for sinusitis, and they don't get better, uh, they come back, this second generation cephalosporin might be a good second choice to try because it's got a bit of expanded coverage uh, compared to your basic amoxicillin. So just for example, we also use second gens for uh, like we might use cefuroxine for UTIs. So if we think about cephalexin having really good E. coli coverage, maybe like 90% or so, uh, this drug has like 98%. It almost is a guaranteed shot. So um, a lot of times we'll use this in a pregnant patient who's got pyelonephritis and they're like, well, we can't use anything else. We definitely want to make sure nothing advances further than it is currently. So we're going to give a higher generation cephalosporin first line, make sure we cover that. So you're seeing this drug, specifically cefuroxine acetyl, same coverage as the, the IV one, just an oral version of it. You're seeing this used a lot more for advanced UTIs or complicated UTIs. It's getting more common for that. Third gen cephalosporins, um, IV split into two components. The first set I have here are ones that don't have activity against pseudomonas, and the second one does have activity against pseudomonas. Ceftriaxone or rocephin is probably one of the most versatile antibiotics we have in our arsenal. It actually is almost recommended for anything from skin and soft tissue to UTI to GI prophylaxis to or GI surgery prophylaxis to intra-abdominal infection to meningitis and the list goes on. We can use it almost anywhere. Now there are certain things it doesn't work well for. Pseudomonas it doesn't cover and MRSA it doesn't cover. But other than that it's a pretty broad spectrum antibiotic uh, within its scope. So it really covers a lot of different um, it covers a lot of different gram negatives. It covers, it has good MSSA, good struct coverage. It has some decent actual anaerobe coverage. However, not quite good enough for GI surgery. With, with um, intra-abdominal infections, GI flora type bugs, the, the big one we're worried about besides, so we're worried about E. coli, which is, lives in the colon. The other big one we're worried about is Bacteroides fragilis, which is an anaerobe, and this does not cover that. So when I say anaerobes, usually I'm talking about Bacteroides specifically, because that's the one that we really care about. Um, there's some other ones too that can be like mouth flora and stuff like that, but for the most part, GI, intra-abdominal, we're talking about Bacteroides. So Ceftriaxis does not cover Bacteroides, but it is a pretty broad spectrum drug, and highly versatile, useful in almost anything. We'll talk about, again, where we use these specifically, but Ceftriaxin is definitely one to know. Other Two cool things about ceftriaxin, in addition to it being versatile, is it's dosed once daily. Um, some infections are like in meningitis or something, they might do it BID, or in a younger patient, they might do it twice daily, but once daily is pretty common for almost everything. The other thing is that it's not renally adjusted. So it's one of the few antibiotics, one of the only beta-lactams we're gonna talk about that isn't renally adjusted. So in a renal impairment patient, you can give it without having to worry about it. So again, rocephin has a ton of advantages to it. Versatile. Um, less frequent dosing and no renal adjustment. It's almost perfect as, as if it could cover MRSA and pseudomonas at the same time, you would have the, the perfect antibiotic there, but it's missing those two components. Um, Ceftazidine is an interesting one, and it's really only useful if you have a pseudomonas infection that you know is sensitive to ceftazidine. Otherwise, we never use this drug. The reason is, is because this drug has terrible strep coverage. So um, if you're looking at a pneumonia, or which strep pneumo is a common pathogen there. Um, it doesn't have good coverage against that. If you're looking at a bloodstream infection, it's missing some of the gram positive pieces that ceftriaxone would cover. So we don't use this empirically. It was big when it first came out, but it's pretty much fallen out of favor. And again, I'm not gonna say anything more about this other than that it's for pseudomonas infections that you know are sensitive to it. You never use this empirically. Um, it's not gonna be useful really for anything else. PO choices. So third gen cephalosporins are the most confusing when it comes to IV and PO because your PO choices are not as good coverage wise as your IV choices. They're just nothing really equivalent. So for example, some of the more advanced 
gram-negative species like Enterobacter, I'll use that as an example of a pathogen, um, you might even see it when you do a sensitivity report and say, oh, their Enterobacter in their urine is sensitive to ceftriaxone, so I'll discharge them on Cefixium or, or one of these third-gen cephalosporins. Actually, it doesn't work. PO third-generation cephalosporins seem to not be able to target those gram-negative species with the aptitude that some of the other ones can. And in fact, some people will say that not to use those cephalosporins at all, whether they're IV or PO. But my point here is that don't think of them as completely interchangeable. In the most cases, they are. Um, that's where the Sanford guide can really come into come in handy because you can look at the spectrums and really compare the class to class and say, oh wow, ceftriaxone has good coverage against this. Um, ceftonir really doesn't. All these drugs have some use here or there: cefixime, ceftonir, cefpidoxime, ceftibutin. Basically, if it's an odd name and starts with a ceft, you can probably think about it as a third-gen cephalosporin oral. Where we see these used clinically, I would say, probably more like advanced UTIs that aren't responding. They might use these for pneumonia uh, as an outpatient, um, community-acquired pneumonia as an oral therapy. They have great strep pneumo coverage and a number of other things. They have um, uh, for resistant sinusitises or complicated ENT-like infections. Uh, they're, they're good for that as well. They have some other um, utility too, but you don't see them all that commonly. They tend to be kind of expensive as well. Pediatric applications for resistant infections orally, you'll see this used more so. All right, your fourth slash fifth generation, you have two drugs here, cefepime. Cefepime is a good one to remember. I put this, put this on the same tier in your head as Zosin. The only thing cefepime, so cefepime is great for pseudomonas. It cover, it's basically like, think about it like a ceftriaxone, but adding that pseudomonas and additional gram-negative coverage. So not only is it like ceftriaxone, but it has broader spectrum of activity. However, it's unlike ceftriaxone in the sense that it's not dosed once daily. It's dosed two or three times a day, and it is, it is renally adjusted. So it doesn't have those nice advantages of ceftriaxone, um, but... It's still a really popular drug. It's very versatile. It applies to any situation where you want just a little bit more gram-negative coverage and you aren't totally comfortable with ceftriaxone. So that'd be like an immunocompromised patient, a person who's been in the hospital for a while and just is readmitting. You don't know what they've been exposed to. And if they've been exposed to like a nosocomial pathogen or an opportunistic pathogen, sometimes those are really hard to treat with a more basic drug like ceftriaxone. Cefepime might cover them better. So cefepime is a really popular um, broad spectrum anti-infective. One of the things it doesn't cover though is bacteroides. So you don't get that anaerobic addition with cefepime. Just like ceftriaxone doesn't cover it, neither does your um, cefepime. The one thing I did miss, I just thought about this, should go back to um, second generation cephalosporin. So I'll just put in a quick caveat here. These drugs, cefoxetin and cefotetin, are IV products, and I really don't want you to know anything about them other than they have pretty standard advanced generation cephalosporin coverage, not pseudomonas, but they do cover um, bacteroides. So these could be used as a monotherapy for surgical site prophylaxis. So remember, we're talking about intra-abdominal infections or pre-GI surgery. Two bugs we're trying to cover, E. coli and bacteroides, and this drug does both of those things. So when we use um, when we talk about intra-abdominal infections in the later slide, I'm going to show you some algorithms for how we treat that, and this is going to come up on there as one of the choices you can use as monotherapy. So it actually has some good utility there, but it's a little bit of an oddball, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. I just wanted to point that out before I totally forget. Okay. Uh, ceftaroline is a fourth or fifth generation, debatable. I don't think it really matters. Who cares, right? Um, it is a cephalosporin. It's the only cephalosporin currently on the market that has MRSA coverage. So um, it was approved for skin and soft tissue infection, also pulmonary infections for MRSA. It's got decent gram-negative therapy uh, coverage, but it doesn't cover pseudomonas. So it's not like an end-all, be-all, right? That'd be the perfect drug here. We're kind of approaching on it. Something that covers everything would be covering... Good gram positive and negative. It has MRSA. It has pseudomonas. It has anaerobes. This it doesn't do that. Um, we don't. I don't see ceftaroline used a ton at our hospital, but it does have some utility here and there for maybe a resistant MRSA or an MRSA plus an allergy to some more standard therapy, possibly. Uh, it's that it's newer in its brand name, but it's not terribly expensive. It's reasonably priced for for being a newer drug. Uh, 
Um, I just put this in here for fun. This is Ceftobipril, which is our fifth generation cephalosporin. It is the magic drug that apparently covers everything. Um, it was approved in, I don't know, there's a, this long history of legal battles behind why this drug doesn't exist. It, it does exist. I think it's used in Europe. Um, we haven't seen it in the U.S. I think the company that was bringing it over from Europe or from whatever, there's a patent suit or whatever, so they didn't, they weren't able to get it approved in any way. It's been tied up in legal uh, purgatory for a number of years. So I don't know if it'll ever exist. Hopefully it does. It'd be a nice advantage because it could be and now that, okay, let's just start Ceftobipril. It covers MRSA, it covers Pseudomonas. It's a great one-stop shop. Right now we have to add something. So if we want to cover broad spectrum when somebody comes in and they're really, really sick to the hospital, we have to cover Pseudomonas and we have to cover MRSA. So that's a lot of times Zosin plus Vancomycin or Cefepime plus Vancomycin. And in this case, you could just do Ceftobipril, but we've never seen it, not on the market yet. Just going to throw it out there because it's kind of fun to talk about. Okay, carbapenems. Whew, you guys still with me, hopefully? The nice thing about a recorded lecture is you can pause it and go have lunch and then come back uh, once you're sick of hearing me talk for a while. And once I get tired of speaking, I can just pause it and go get a drink of water or something or go eat lunch as well. So it works out for everybody, hopefully. Anyway, uh, you guys are like, can you just finish the lecture, please? Sorry, I'm trying to entertain myself while I stand at home talking out loud. <laughs> um, Carbapenems are a really big gun drugs. Uh, these are massively broad spectrum. So if we talk about our tier, our highest tier of broad spectrum, Zosin, Cefepime, Carbapenems are right there with them. In fact, more so. Um, they really cover almost any gram negative. It doesn't mean that they're better though, so I want to make that cl clarification. Actually, sometimes you'll see a resistance report and say, hey, this gram negative species is resistant to everything but zosin. It's actually resistant to any penum, but it's susceptible to zosin. So it doesn't mean it's better, but the likelihood of this being more susceptible is higher. However, actually in recent years, we've seen Pseudomonas in particular become more resistant to uh, or more, um, yeah, resist, or what am I trying to say? <laughs> Lose its sensitivity, yeah, become more resistant to imipenem. So imipenem is no longer as effective to pseudomonas as it once was, whereas zosin and cefepime actually have maintained their effectiveness pretty well. So what that means for us is that carbapenems are still quite broad spectrum. And for things that produce what we call extended spectrum beta-lactamase inhibitors, so if you've ever heard of an ESBL bacteria, what that is is extended spectrum beta-lactamase. It means that this bacteria produces a beta-lactamase that can crush a lot of our, our, our nice drugs like zosin and maybe even cefepime. Um, there are some drugs also that produce carbapenemase, which breaks down carbapenem specifically, like Klebsiella is a, anti, is a gram-negative species that is a urinary tract bug. It, it, it can cause sepsis, it cause all sorts of things. But it's uh, it's one that is the notorious one nation or uh, around the world for producing carbapenem, being carbapenemase producing. And the thing is, if you get some sort of really problematic extended spectrum beta lactamase producer, it's difficult. Even if you think, even if your lab report says, "Hey, zosin might work," you might be like, "Well, that that's got extended spectrum beta lactamase producing though." So the lab's telling me that zosin is sensitive right now, but over time it might fail. What wouldn't fail, though, is maybe a carbapenem. So carbapenems are much more resilient to extended spectrum beta-lactamase production, um, but you can still have that separate tier of carbapenemase production. So I'm trying to separate these, those two, too. You get these different enzymes that bacteria produce, and ESBL is a really common thing that's used when we talk about multi-drug resistant organisms, um, but carbapenemase is, is a separate thing that's just a different enzyme. Hopefully that makes sense a little bit. But let's talk about carbapenems. You have imipenem, uh, which is coupled with a drug called psilostatin, uh, brand name Primaxin. Uh, Primaxin, when we talk about uh, beta-lactams having side effects in the central nervous system, imipenem has been the highest associated with that. In fact, we don't use doses very high with imipenem. We use lower than the clinical trials because of that. And it's actually pretty effective at the lower dose. It doesn't really matter. Um, but for people with high seizure risk, uh, it could be something to consider. Uh, let's see. One thing you can't use imipenem for is CNS infection. So uh, meningitis, you wouldn't use imipenem to so have poor CNS penetration. Meropenem, pretty much just like imipenem, has good CNS penetration. Um, so that would be a real alternative. 
these are pretty expensive generally a lot of hospitals have just one on formulary so if you say oh i want to order mirapenem i say nope sub to imipenem unless you have a really good reason for doing that and if you really want something off formulary talk to your pharmacist about it just a word of advice but um, imipenem miropenem and doripenem are all very similar in spectrum of activity they're a very broad spectrum they all cover pseudomonas they all do great things for our uh, adding to our broad spectrum arsenal and they're all essentially interchangeable the one difference being imipenem with the cns penetration erdapenem is the oddball in the group which is still a very broad spectrum very useful gram negative coverage agent however it doesn't cover pseudomonas so that's the big difference between the erdapenem and the rest of the penem so if you remember one thing about carbapenems besides them being really broad spectrum that should be the baseline knowledge you have Remember, erdapenem does not cover pseudomonas. Uh, what else do I want to say about these guys? I think that's about it. Okay. Uh, allergies and cross-reactivity. So I talked about allergies. Penicillin allergies are really commonly reported. Literature says up to 10% of patients report penicillin allergies, but the vast majority of those patients, if you did a skin test on them, would not react to them. People report them because they think they were allergic to it or they thought they got a rash to it or they did in their childhood and now they don't have that antibody anymore. It doesn't matter. It just is rare to actually see a real reaction. Um, immune mediated versus something else is important to consider too. Are we talking about did they get nauseous when they took their amoxicillin orally and now we want to give them Zosin? That doesn't matter. Okay, It's not getting into the GI tract as much. Um, it's not, probably not going to mess with the way they, their stomach is feeling because it's not processing it the same way. I highly doubt they're going to feel a lot of nausea on it. They might because it's still going to get in there eventually and affect the flora composition potentially. But at the same time, if they're really sick, we don't really care about nausea. We can treat that with another medication if that does happen. What we do care about is uh, hypersensitivity reactions, so anaphylaxis, hives, those types of things. A plain rash, uh, it's a little iffy. We don't really know if that's something we care that much about. And again, it depends on how serious the infection is. We want to avoid anything. So like if somebody's not got nauseous to a med, we don't just want to say, too bad, uh, nausea isn't a big deal. We'll just, you can deal with that at home. If there's a reasonable alternative, we want to go with it. But sometimes there isn't. So my point is that just to take some of these allergies with a little bit of grain of salt, unless you see the, the significant things like, Anaphylaxis, throat swelling, couldn't breathe, stuff like that is, is things we want to, oh, well, I don't know, maybe we should take a second step back here. So let's say you have somebody who says, I have anaphylaxis to penicillin. Um, cephalosporins have like about a 2% cross reactivity, which is low enough where it means we don't really care all that much. If cephalosporins are the preferred agent, we're going to use them. Good example here, um, gonorrhea is treated with ceftriaxone IM, one time dose. And this is a common thing we get uh, where you get somebody in ED or urgent care who has a suspected exposure or a positive gonorrhea test and they have an allergy, they got hives to penicillin years ago or amoxicillin or whatever it was. Um, we just say, all right, we're going to give it to you. We're going to watch you in the ED for a little bit and make sure everything goes well. And that's really all there is to it. Cross reactivity, very low possible. And in fact, um, our hospital policy says that if somebody does have a true type 1 hypersensitivity reaction to a penicillin, we could consider giving them a cep or uh, skip the cephalosporin and go straight to the carbapenem. But most studies will say that that's not even necessary. It's a precaution we take. And again, if you really need to get that cephalosporin, just do it. Do it in a controlled environment where you have access to epinephrine and Benadryl and things like that. And we'll talk about anaphylax in another lecture. But um, carbapenem is really low cross-reactivity. You can do something called a graded challenge, too, if you're really... Um, you, well, first of all, you can do two things. You could desensitize somebody, which is where you give very small doses over time and kind of escalate the dose. Over There's protocols out there that are well studied. Usually you do it over several hours in a day, and by the time you're done, um, the person's ready to go. It doesn't have that allergy anymore. That's a good option for some things. The other thing you can do is a graded challenge where somebody's like, oh, I think I had an allergy to this, and you give one hundredth of the dose. That goes well. You give one tenth of the dose. That goes well then you can give the full dose i've never seen anyone do an actual graded challenge most people just start an infusion on somebody and if they start reacting <laughs> they stop the infusion and, and give some 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 diphenhydramine or some epinephrine but um, usually again these cross reactivities are quite rare uh, monobactam as trinam is a monobactam it's the only drug that doesn't really cross react with anything so the only time we use this is for severely well documented 
beta-lactam allergies. So somebody who's allergic to carbapenem has a documented anaphylactic allergy to carbapenem, cephalosporins, and all your penicillins, and you need broad-spectrum antibiotic, this is the drug. So this drug covers pseudomonas. Um, it's very broad-spectrum. It does not cover anaerobic bacteria. That's its one weakness. Um, and again, the only time we're using this is for severely allergic patients. It's really expensive. So unless you know for sure you need it, don't order it. Very rare. Okay, first class of major drugs covered, spectrum review. Here's just some buckets to consider. We've talked about uh, one drug that covers MRSA. So right off the bat, you can see our, our biggest weakness with beta-lactam drugs is MRSA coverage. So ceftaroline is the only drug that covers MRSA. Pseudomonas, uh, I've listed the ones here that cover pseudomonas. Anaerobes, zosin, doripenem, I think I, I forgot... Uh, Cephoxidin, uh, which is that second generation cephalosporin. And remember, anaerobes, B. Fragile. Bacter Bacteroides fragilis is our, is our anaerobe that pathogenically we're worried most about here. So, again, some of these drugs like ceftriaxone actually cover some anaerobic species, but they don't cover bacteroides, and that's the GI one we're concerned about. Nothing, we're going to talk about atypical pathogens. Nothing covers atypicals that, in the beta-lactam class. So that's one another weakness they have. But otherwise, they've got some great broad-spectrum options. So moving on. Other gram-positive cell wall agents. Vancomycin. So I mentioned vanco already. It's hard not to talk about vanco at all when you're talking about ID. Vanco is a really big molecule. It's up here. It's a glycopeptide. And it's a really powerful gram-positive agent. I think some people are like, oh, vancomycin, it's really broad spectrum. And you should always be careful when you use it. But vancomycin is actually not a broad spectrum antibiotic. It's actually pretty narrow spectrum. It's really just gram-positive coverage. It covers staph really, really well, covers strep pretty well, and it covers enterococcus. That's it. It doesn't cover gram-negative stuff. The only, we, the only time I think vancomycin gets its... Um, what I, what I want to say. It's reputation for being broad spectrum because it's always coupled with something really broad spectrum. So we always use Vanco plus cefepime or Vanco plus Sosin or Vanco plus Primaxin. And in this case, the only thing you're doing is adding MRSA coverage. So really Vancomycin is just an MRSA agent. That's all we're using it for. And once we realize that patient doesn't have MRSA, the Vanco gets dropped um, pretty fast. So a lot of people are on Vanco for a day or two and then it's stopped. It is part of our protocol though. If somebody is likely at risk or is septic or very sick, severe septic shock, we're going to start them on vancomycin anyway because we don't know for sure. And if it is MRSA, that one dose of vanco that they got could be what's saving their life because um, sepsis has a really high mortality rate, so it's worth doing. However, we want to follow our, use our detective skills and follow our culture data. So if we see that there's no gram-positive bacteria, the blood culture comes back growing E. coli, get rid of that vanco right away. But um, Vanco does come, just a couple other things about Vanco I want to point out. It's bactericidal, but it's kind of a slow killer, so some people don't prefer it. Uh, you could use, and again, it's an MRSA-specific agent mostly. You can use it for MSSA. It will work for MSSA. However, it's slower killing, so people usually prefer uh, cefazolin or maybe one of the, the anti-staphylococcal penicillins like nafcillin would be preferred for those uh, products. Unless you're really allergic to those medications, then Vanco might be good. But for the most part, if it's not MRSA, we're, we're getting rid of Vanco. Um, IV and oral. So the, the big thing to remember here, and I'll trick you on the test purposefully to make sure you understand this concept, is that vancomycin IV and oral do not interchange with each other. Vancomycin IV is for your serious infections, MRSA-related infections, vancomycin PO, is not absorbed systemically. It stays in the GI tract, and the only time we use it is for C. diff infections, so Clostridium difficile, which is usually caused by, well, it's caused by a number of things, kind of a nosocomial, but there's community. Talk about C. diff in more detail later, but that's the only time we use Vanco orally. Um, I remember I watched, like, what show was it? Uh, Sons of Anarchy, I think. Uh, I don't know. I even watched very much of it, but there's this one where this there's somebody got a gunshot wound, and there's one of the person people was a doctor, and she was like, uh, "Give him some oral vancomycin." I'm like, "Really? That's the drug you picked? You had all the drugs to pick in the world, and you picked the one that you can't give that makes absolutely no sense to give in that situation." Uh, is he, does the guy have C diff in addition to his gunshot? I'm not entirely sure, um, but maybe she knows something I didn't. 
but anyway, it's it's kind of funny that um, that you see that stuff in media. But the point is, and hopefully that helps you remember, do not use oral vancomycin interchangeably with IV and vice versa. They don't go both ways. Okay, think about the GI tract as kind of a barrier, IV vancomycin. Some people say that for really severe C. diff infections, IV vanco will get into the, the GI tract. I don't know. I, it's generally not not as effective as giving it orally, which is going to get directly to the site. So take that for what it's worth. Okay, uh, pharmacy to dose protocols. Vancomycin is arguably what invented clinical pharmacy in a hospital setting. So pharmacists back in the day used to just kind of sit in the main pharmacy, dispense product, whatever. And then somebody had the bright idea, said, why don't I look at these antibiotics you're giving and make sure that the dose is within a therapeutic range so that people aren't getting side effects and also it's being effective. And so what happened was that pharmacists were looking at blood levels and dosing the antibiotic specifically. And that actually still happens today. So a lot of times when you order vancomycin, if you're in a hospital setting, you're going to order a pharmacy to dose vancomycin protocol. And then that pharmacist is going to look at the patient's weight, look at their renal function, order some starting doses, order some repeat labs after a couple doses, see what the level looks like, and then adjust after that. And the nice thing about this is you actually know what your levels are, you can follow them very closely. You know that your patient isn't getting way too much. And if they did happen to really accumulate, so for example, you give somebody a big dose because their kidneys look great when they come into the hospital. Two days later, they have acute kidney injury and their serum creatinine is sky high. Well, um, no one could have really predicted that necessarily. And now all of a sudden you've got a lot of vanco in the tank that you need to eliminate from the patient's body. So then you let them kind of excrete it out naturally. You don't need to redose for a while, it's a benefit. But the nice thing is you can look at the level specifically at each given interval and figure out where you need to be redose, uh, uh, increase your dose, decrease your dose, change your dosing interval to more frequent, less frequent. And that's something that's rare. We don't do that with many antibiotics. The other ones we do it with are aminoglycosides, but we don't use aminoglycosides very much anymore. So Vanco is really the only thing that clinical pharmacists do uh, commonly this and again that's kind of the start of our practice now we do a ton of other stuff but um, this is sort of where clinical pharmacy was invented uh, vancomycin may be ototoxic and renally toxic at high doses renal toxicity is a little bit of an issue when you're looking at whether it actually cause vanco causes renal toxicity or prevents or maybe i don't know contributes to it I think there's some evidence out in the literature that's a little bit conflicting over whether vancomycin is for sure the culprit, <clears throat> but it's thought to be renally uh, toxic at high doses, and it's also thought to be ototoxic at high doses. So that's another good reason for having pharmacists monitor levels on it, as opposed to just ordering 1,500 milligrams Q8 hours and moving on with your life. You order pharmacy to dose, they order 1,500 Q8, and then um, it comes back, the level is twice the size you need it to be, and like, oh shoot, we need to really decrease this on this patient. Um, other glycopeptides, lipopeptides, uh, some other thing, the really the only one on the slide I care about you knowing is daptomycin. Uh, so the question comes up, what happens if vanco is resistant? Well, vanco resistant, MR, uh, vanco resistant staph aureus, so VRSA, it's extremely rare. And in fact, we don't really have any many documented cases of it in Minnesota within the last several years. I think there's a handful. It's very, very rare. Um, so basically, vanco should work for every staph aureus case you get. Now, if you have um, enterococcus, which has vancomycin resistant, enterococcus is more common. Daptomycin is good for that. Um, also, if your vancomycin MIC pushes high, so I, I gave this example earlier, but the idea is that the, the lab will say, the, the example is that the lab will say that the MIC of vanco is one. That's an okay MIC, I can work with that. It might say it's two. If it says it's two, it will still say it's susceptible. But there is literature that says vancomycin MICs of two. It's just too high of an MIC. You have to push your vanco concentration too high for too many doses to get to that uh, killing point where it's just not as effective. So use something else. So if that vanco MIC creeps up, daptomycin becomes an alternative. Or if they're allergic to vancomycin and they need MRSA coverage, dapto can be an alternative. Dapto is really expensive. So I had one class asked me, they said, oh, some ID guy came in and he's talking about how great DAPTO is. Well, DAPTO is fine, but DAPTO costs like $1,000 for a dose. Vancomycin probably costs 10 bucks, 100 bucks. Anyway, it's about, it's way less expensive per dose. So one thing to consider is cost. DAPTO is very expensive. DAPTO also is not effective for central nervous system infections or pulmonary infections. The pulmonary surfactant actually, um, breaks down daptomycin. So you can't use it for a pneumonia and you can't use it for meningitis. 
whereas you can use Vanco for those two things. So Dapto has some good utility as a second option, but it is still always and probably always will be second line to Vanco unless you have a really good reason to use it. Um, the rest of these drugs, you can read them if you want to. They're more MRSA agents, basically, that, that work for that, but I'm not going to get into them in, in tons of detail. The one cool one at the bottom, Oritavancin, is a single-dose, 245-hour half-life medication. Um, the idea here is that if you come into the hospital and you say, well, and you have, uh, or maybe you have an MRSA infection, cellulitis, but you're not really sick enough to need hospitalization, but you need vancomycin, what happens now is people generally come into infusion centers a couple times a day and get their vanco dose. The idea behind oritavancin is you give a dose of it once and that covers the person for the whole course of their cellulitis. It covers MRSA. Yeah, it's 1200 bucks, but you don't have to drive to an infusion center. You don't have to get repeated doses of vancomycin. Overall, it's probably more cost effective. So it's an interesting new strategy. We don't do anything with that as a hospital pharmacist, but um, from a clinic perspective, you might see that being done more. All right, so reviewing our spectrum, we really just added two um, MRSA agents, so Vanco and Dapto, and remember I added the cefoxitin over here. Um, and that's really all I want you to know about that specific slide. So don't worry about Televancin or any of those ones, uh, just for your information. We don't use them very often. All right, moving on. Protein synthesis inhibitors, hodgepodge of medications here, tetracyclines. Um, Generally, are bacteriostatic. There's a drug called tigacycline that's not commonly used that isn't, that's bactericidal. Um, MRSA coverage for tetracyclines is, is a key aspect to them being effective. Um, they have a, a wide variety and interesting spectrum of activity, I think. Avoid in children younger than eight, they can cause a graying of the teeth. This is a little bit controversial. We'll talk about this during peds more so. And generally, we avoid them in pregnancy as well. All right. So, couple drugs here that are popular. Tetracycline itself isn't really used all that much anymore. It's dose QID. It's got GI side effects. It's the only one that's really adjusted. It's got some strikes against it. Uh, minocycline is a commonly used daily drug or twice day drug for acne. Uh, that's pretty much its major indication. Doxycycline is an IV and PO, and doxy is a really versatile antibiotic. I think it's one that's forgotten about. I think <clears throat> if you're ever in a bind and you're like, oh, this person has a lot of allergies and they have kind of some odd bacteria growing or it's not an infection, ask, ask yourself, does Doxy cover this? It's a interestingly, it's a uniquely versatile antibiotic that covers a lot of gram-positive, gram-negative. It has Lyme disease use, anthrax, plague, malaria. A lot of unusual diseases uh, are useful with uh, tetracyclines. Um, Tigacycline is a really broad spectrum drug that's rarely ever used. It's got some Issues with increased mortality. It's got a black box warning for increased death and you know, some other stuff too. It's kind of end of the line therapy. Um, but doxycycline would be the one to remember here. We'll talk about where that comes into play. But MRSA coverage is uh, a big one to remember about these as well. Uh, macrolides. Macrolides are mostly gram negative and atypical coverage, some basic gram positive coverage as well. They're pretty hard on the GI tract. Um, and there's a couple different ones out there. In fact, erythromycin is a promotility agent. It's used more for um, GI-related disease that needs uh, increased motility versus its antibiotic. Clarithromycin is really only commonly used in um, <clears throat> peptic ulcer disease or H. pylori infections, which we'll talk about in the next uh, antibiotic set of slides. Azithromycin or Zithromax is probably the most common one. A lot of people have probably heard of a ZPAC. Uh, Z-packs really have no utility anymore in current practice. It depends on what you're trying to treat, but for the most part they were useful for pneumonia for a while. But the problem with azithromycin is it's not very good against strep pneumo. In fact, the resistance is quite high. I think our resistance is like over 70%. And strep pneumo is a really common pneumonia pathogen. It's a common upper respiratory pathogen as well too. So always be careful for prescribing a Z-pack. There are some indications, like for example, um, strep throat, uh, zithromycin does cover group A strep pretty well, and for people who are allergic to penicillins, uh, it can be a nice option for them that's pretty effective. But for strep pneumo, the, the pulmonary one, it just does not have good coverage against that. So z packs tend to be problematic and tend to be not effective when they're prescribed. I, I can't even count how many people I've seen come into the ER who got a z pack and now are, are more sick because they got it prescribed inappropriately. So lots of 
problems with it. However, it does cover, cover atypical pathogens, which can also be a cause of pneumonia. So that is in itself is a, is a nice use for them. However, you have to add something to the z pack or the zithromycin to give them a better chance of covering everything. So for example, azithromycin plus a second or third generation cephalosporin to pick up that strep pneumo coverage is a common um, uh, strep, uh, sorry, community acquired pneumonia treatment option. Aminoglycosides, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because we really don't use them anymore. They're really popular. They're very broad spectrum gram negative bugs or uh, bug coverage and they cover pseudomonas. Uh, so if you do see them used, it's probably going to be in advanced cases where people aren't responding or are resistant. So sometimes we pull these out for people who have a bacterial infection that might be ESBL or maybe um, is resistant to carbapenems or something like that. Um, gentamicin, amikacin, those drugs can still work in those cases. And uh, you don't see as many allergies to these. If somebody has a lot of anaphylaxis to a variety of beta-lactams. These can come into play as a second line option. I did say this earlier, but renally problematic. They can kill people's kidneys. Uh, if you're on an aminoglycoside for any amount of time, no matter how great your kidneys are, you will eventually get some renal toxicity. It's just a matter of time. It should go back to normal once it's done, hopefully, but uh, it's not worth the risk for a lot of patients. So these have really fallen out of favor because of this reason, and uh, we just have safer choices. Cefepime, Zosin, Carbapenems, they work just as well, if not better in some cases, and they're better tolerated. Clinda. Uh, clindamycin or cleosin is a POIV medication. It's got kind of a unique spectrum of activity. So one thing to remember about clinda, gram positive and anaerobic coverage. It's gram negative coverage is generally pretty weak, but it does cover MRSA sometimes, although its staph coverage is a little bit variable, but it can cover MRSA. It also covers anaerobic bacteria. I think of clinda more as like an upper anaerobe, so like above maybe above the diaphragm type of anaerobes, or maybe even like sinusitis, oral, um, like dental infections, uh, those types of things where those oral anaerobes tend to respond well to clindamycin. And also clindamycin will cover strep and some of the other like MCAT and um, H influenza, some of the other gram positives that are in the ENT area that uh, it, it should work pretty well for. So clinda is a good option for that. Clinda also has some nice utility as a non-allergy medication, meaning that if you have allergies to everything, you usually aren't allergic to clindamycin. So clindamycin oftentimes gets used because of people's allergies. So if somebody has an allergy to cefazolin or cephalexin, they might get clindamycin post-surgery because it's got pretty decent skin soft tissue bug coverage. It should cover most strep species. And again, it's, it's staph aureus coverage. I don't think is great. It's like 70%. But um, if you have an allergy, it, it does cover a, a number of things that way. Some other gram-positive agents. Linazolid is Zyvox. It's an IV and PO bacterial static agent that is useful for vancomycin-resistant gram-positive infections. It's also a PO. So if you wanted to discharge somebody on a medication that is MRSA useful and also oral, this is a good choice. Zyvox wasn't used very often because it was insanely expensive. It's like 150 bucks a pill or something. Um, it went generic and it actually is really cheap now. So don't be afraid to use Zyvox if you need to, but I think some people still are afraid of it because it was so expensive. And this pharmacists were always like, don't use these drugs, they're too expensive, use something else. And in this case, maybe we overdid it a little bit. <laughs> Um, quinupristin, dolphopristin, synersid, don't worry about this one too much. It kind of falls in the televancin category where it's an additional MRSA agent that's not used very often. Um, so this would be an addition to or an alternative to vancomycin or DAPTO if you needed something with MRSA coverage that, uh, it's not, that's not, um, it's not the same as something else. One thing I'll just point out is that we have a lot of MRSA drugs, so there's a lot of backups. So you've got the Vansins, you've got this drug, you've got linazolid, you've got Dapto. Um, you've got a lot of things in case vancomycin fails. So vancomycin is kind of like your entry-level MRSA agent, and you've got a lot of other choices you can wiggle around with. So we added some things here. Linazolid, doxy, clindamycin, uh, aminoglycosides cover pseudomonas. Clindamycin covers anaerobes. And I'll put or like kind of upper, it does cover bacteroides, but it's not really commonly used for GI-related infections. Upper anaerobes. 
Uh, and oh, doxycycline does cover atypical pathogens too. So um, doxy can be used for community acquired pneumonia. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But okay, I think we got a couple more left. All right, a popular choice, fluoroquinones are kind of an oddball mechanistically. They inhibit DNA gyrase, which causes double-stranded DNA breakage. So they're a different mechanism of action, which makes them synergistic with a lot of other things. Um, they're very broad spectrum. They have good gram-negative, pretty good gram-positive, and atypical pathogen coverage. Um, so they even have some anaerobes, depending on the species. So it's, I'll tell you, I'll show you the different ones and, and how they differ. But um, they're three commonly used agents. All are both... Uh, IV NPO, which makes your hospital transition easy. If you're on an IV fluoroquinolone, you just convert orally. It's usually one to one. Really great bioavailability on these agents. So these are ones where if somebody's healthy and they're coming into the hospital, somebody had a question last week. This is a great example of a drug you would start somebody on orally if they're if they can tolerate it, um, because it's got good bioavailability and there's really no reason to give somebody an IV unless you absolutely have to. All right. Popularity, these are really popular drugs. They're, um, they came on the market as, and rightfully so, they cover a lot of stuff, they're very versatile, but problem is they're kind of susceptible to resistance. So we've seen fluoroquinolone resistance go up uh, a lot in the last several years, which is unfortunate. Um, so reserve them. I think if we can get by with something else, generally it's nicer to use a different bug or a different drug to cover something, but uh, fluoroquinolones definitely still have plenty of utility. Uh, tendon rupture. Probably one of the biggest side effects with these is uh, this, hit, or some one thing you'll hear, they're kind of notorious for causing tendon rupture in kids and elderly. This hasn't been well studied or proven, but it's definitely something that's documented in case reports and things. And I'll talk about this more with kids, um, but there's some clinical animal models that show tendon rupture. Uh, fluoroquinolones have a lot of other things going on with them too. They have like risk of neuropathy warnings, um, increases in blood sugar for diabetic patients, some other things like that. Generally speaking, fluoroquinolones probably don't have the best safety profile of all of our medications and um, not the best tolerated for most people, but they're still pretty useful in the grand scheme of things, not too bad. And the drugs, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and moxifloxacin. There's also ofloxacin, and I think there's another one out there too that's not very commonly used, but these three are gonna be the most common. Um, Cipro is the most basic. It's mostly just gram negative plus atypicals. It would cover like usually some staph aureus like M MSSA. It might be susceptible to it. Um, and it does have some pseudomonas coverage. The interesting thing about uh, fluoroquinolones, they're the only drugs that come orally that cover pseudomonas. So if you have somebody growing pseudomonas in their urine, you better hope it's susceptible to a fluoroquinolone. Otherwise, they're going to have to come in for IV therapy. Uh, levofloxacin, similar to Cipro, uh, more gram-positive coverage and extended gram-negative coverage, just a more broad-spectrum option. Moxifloxacin has the best gram-positive coverage. In fact, it covers some MRSA, and it's only fluoroquinolone that covers anaerobes. So for GI infections, it's useful. Um, it does not concentrate in urine, however, so you can't use moxifloxacin for a UTI, and it also doesn't cover pseudomonas. So those are the differences. Otherwise, they're they're really actually quite similar, so don't get too hung up on the differences. Uh, moxifloxacin and levofloxacin are both considered respiratory fluoroquinolones and are preferred agents for community-acquired pneumonia because they cover atypical pathogens and they cover strep pneumo quite well. Sulfa drugs, uh, sulfamethoxyl, trimethoprim, Bactrim, uh, mostly gram-negative, some gram-positive activity. Uh, Bactrim is a good MRSA agent. It doesn't have much strep though. However, it does cover respiratory strep. So it doesn't cover like the strep pyogenes that grows on your skin, but it covers the strep pneumo that could be in your lungs. So take that for what it's worth. It also has some interesting extended spectrum like uh, certain types of fungi respond to it. Um, it's also used prophylactically for immunocompromised patients in some cases. Uh, frequently used for UTIs and skin and soft tissue. And again, our MRSA is a coverage point there. Just a quick uh, discussion about what do you do if you, I've talked about these scary things like ESBLs and carbapenemases and stuff like that. What do you do if you, you don't have anything that works? Old drugs, uh, colistin and chloramphenicol are two med medications um, that have been used for this. So there's colistamethate and um, they, they both are pretty toxic and I'm not gonna ask you a lot about these medications. I don't think I even have a test question on them. Just to know that they exist. 
And that if we do get to the end of the line, there are some options there for people. Um, it's not like we're in total dire straits, but it is tricky. And again, they are usually renal to renally toxic is a big one and some other toxicities that I've listed there too. Topical stuff, mupirocin, bacitracin, uh, polymyxin. Polymyxin B is actually one of the older ones they've brought back too as a IV therapy for, um, for stuff like this. So that can kind of go into this category as well, just FYI. But these topical agents usually work well to cover a lot of skin bugs. Remember when we're talking about skin, we're talking about staph, strep mostly. Um, so MRSA coverage is key, like mupirocin covers MRSA. Bacitracin does as well, decently. Uh, that's all you really need to know. UTI, specific urinary agents, phosphomycin is this one-time dose. You can repeat it if it's a complicated one, but usually it's a one-time dose, cell wall destruction. It's an interesting option for people who have tried other things and need to do something because they've got resistance and allergies. Um, I ended up doing this on a person recently because they were allergic to everything and they had the one thing they weren't allergic to which our anti antibiotic report showed that it should have been their e coli should have been sensitive to it was re didn't work it didn't cure their uti they still had symptoms so that now they're back so we tried an extended course of phosphomycin i don't know whatever happened with them <laughs> but it's it's kind of a, an, odd, an oddball that you see for UTIs. It's complicated. It does cover really weird stuff, though. Like um, it has some minor pseudomonas coverage. It has MRSA coverage, covers enterococcus, some of those otter gram-positive pathogens that are difficult to treat with our standard uh, UTI drugs. Nitrofurantoin or macrobid is a really popular UTI agent. First line, I think about the perfect patient for macrobid as a youngish, healthy female, somebody under 65 no kidney issues. Uh, Macrobed really doesn't have any systemic effects. It goes straight to the to the bladder and it's not doesn't penetrate kidney tissue so not good for like a pyelonephritis but for an uncomplicated UTI its E. coli coverage is like 95 percent so it's it's a pretty much a sure bet and it's a very effective uh, medication for that. Um, again not for a complicated UTI or pyelonephritis. Metronidazole is flagell. Uh, Flagyl is a medication that can cover anaerobes really well, and I think about its main use. It's got a couple things we'll talk about during the uh, therapeutic discussion we're going to have before the exam, but its main use is an adjunct therapy to, to cover anaerobes. So if you, for example, want to give somebody cefepime and vancomycin for whatever infection, but you want anaerobic coverage on, because cefepime doesn't cover that, or if you give somebody ceftriaxone, you're like, well, I want bacteroides coverage as well, you add metronidazole on. That's probably its most common use. That's some other things like it's useful for Clostridium difficile, bacterial vaginosis, a couple other things like that. All the disulfiram reaction. Uh, it, it, it inhibits the way your body um, metabolizes ethanol and it can make you feel really sick even if you drink a small amount of alcohol with it. So it's a good counseling point to anyone on flagell. GI effects. Uh, these agents not for systemic infections. They're just for the GI. There's rifaximin which is for travelers, diarrhea, also useful for hepatic encephalopathy. There's fidaxomycin, which is difficid, which is a C. diff agent, which we'll talk about in the next set of slides. All right, so here's your final, final slide here, spectrum review. All your MRSA agents lined up, all your pseudomonas agents lined up, your anaerobes or bacteroides agents, uh, your atypical pathogens there. So when we go into, so this is a good review going into, in a couple weeks, we're going to talk about the actual treatments. We're going to go through cellulitis and endocarditis and pneumonia and everything like that. And we'll go through first line options, scenarios where we might choose something else and try and apply some of this clinically. So good intro. Um, try and review this. Review it a couple times if you need to. Go through it slowly um, and just try and learn the language of antibiotics. It is confusing. There's a lot of drugs right off the bat, but try and separate them into categories and classes. Look at spectrums of activity and try and break them up that way too. So I like to think about them in a couple different ways. So I like to classify them. That helps me remember things like side effects and things like dosing strategies. And then I like to classify them in terms of spectrum of activity. So what's kind of on the same tier um, when we're looking at everything antibiotic related, which ones can kind of be used interchangeably, even if they're in different classes. So those are some of the things that I think about. Um, so you could consider that when you're studying. All right, uh, that's it. We won't meet this week. You'll meet George. Um, next week will be
uh, just a quick antifungal lecture is what I'll post online. And I'll also probably post the case review as well. And then the week before the exam, we'll go through the final antibiotic lecture and we'll talk about um, some other things as far as review and things like that. So that's all I got for you. Enjoy.